greeting of the day everyone i am privileged to welcome you all to the third edition of orange the literature festival organized by sgr knowledge foundation in association with gh raisan university powered by raisan group of institution i am sanjeev mishra and i am delighted to be your anchor for today's session green human natural world by rohan chakravarti natur is rolling up into a ball like wagon to avoid meeting people rohan is a cartoonist illustrator and the creator of green humor series of cartoon comics and illustration of wildlife and nature conservation cartoon from green humor appear periodically in newspaper columns magazines and journal illustration from green humor have been used for several projects and campaigns for wildlife in awareness and conservation rohan has authored five books and has won awards by undp century asia wwf international royal bank of bank of scotland and publishing next for his work it's an honor to have you with us today sir thanks for the introduction so, sanjeev most welcome sir Also moving ahead, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the support of Penguin Publication, as their association is extremely valuable to Orange City Literature Festival. Having said that, now I will let my audience enjoy the privilege of listening to Rohan Sir today, and would like to humbly invite Sir to lead us ahead. Thanks a lot, Sanjeevni. Thanks for introducing your audience to me. I'll uh, first begin by sharing my. the screen for my section hello everyone good afternoon it's uh, a real pleasure to uh, be introducing two books that i have uh, had the fortune of releasing this year green humor for a green planet and naturalist ready to my own home hometown my home city nagpur i am i am from nagpur and it's uh, a double honor for me to be addressing this panel because uh, i've been born and brought up in nagpur and all uh, everything i've learned about nature actually comes from the city so uh, uh, thanks for having me here uh, the organizers of uh, the orange city literature festival and also my publishers at penguin for for arranging this association uh, my work deals with my work as a cartoonist and illustrator deals with wildlife conservation and environmental issues Uh, almost all my entire portfolio as a cartoonist speaks about these issues in cartoons in illustrations and i assist uh, wildlife conservation organizations and forest departments not just in india but also abroad in uh, spreading the word about environmental awareness and wildlife conservation through cartoons and my first book green humor for a green planet is a compilation of about 11 years of uh, such published work which i will first take you through before i begin with my slide show i'd just like to introduce you to this uh, map illustration i did for icli the international council for local Envi environmental initiatives uh, it is an urban biodiversity map of nagpur it, uh, our, our orange city and it shows roughly what kind of wildlife to expect in which part of the city right from the migratory birds that come all the way from siberia to gorewada lake in our north to uh, to all the scrub wildlife the wild boars the wolves and the leopards that are found towards the south of the city around vardha road that connects to uh, to some of our tiger reserves so this map hangs at the nagpur municipal corporation office those of you who are interested can pay a visit and take a look at the map so why i do what i do is because i think there is a need for humor in conservation communication uh, like our celebrities and uh, politicians wildlife cannot stage controversies to be in the news and so they need creative spokespersons and that's where people like me uh, not just people like me but also uh, other kinds of creative communicators like artists like uh, uh, writers like photographers and animators all of us could come together and bridge this gap of communication i always begin with a game uh, when i'm trying to explain my work to an audience uh, and this game involves Uh, you trying to identify three sets of entities that i will present on the screen so the first one is here it's a recent blockbuster that has released and i'm sure all of you who are attending this will be able to easily identify who all these people are in this picture right ajay devgan 
Akshay Kumar, Katrina Kaif, and Ranveer Singh. The next set of entities, even though they are wearing masks, their face are, faces are covered, you will very easily be able to tell who these people are, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But this creature is something that our lives directly revolve around. And yet, we might not know exactly what this creature is. I'm sure a lot of you will guess that it's a dragonfly, yes. But a dragonfly is a very vague answer. It's like calling Akshay Kumar a human being, you know. You won't look at Akshay Kumar's picture and say it's a human being, right? You'll say it is Akshay Kumar. So why not, Why can't we as, uh, as audiences uh, or as something that uh, the dragonfly's life revolves so closely around us, or around ours, why can't we identify this creature correctly? And that is my grouse with the way uh, environmental information or information around wildlife and science and ecology is presented to audiences like us, to lay audiences like us. And this is what I'm trying to cha change through my work. So this dragonfly, I'll tell you why it is so important to humankind. It's because uh, A, it is the longest migrating insect in the world. It is called the globe skimmer. And it comes to our part of the world all the way from northern latitudes like Russia and like Japan which spans about 5,000 to 6,000 kilometers. And for an insect, that is a huge feat. The second part is that this creature comes to India just after the monsoons when mosquitoes have started breeding. And mosquitoes are its main prey. So this creature, by, by virtue of hunting mosquitoes, is actually saving us from diseases. And therefore, human life revolves directly around that of the dragonfly, of this particular dragonfly, Instead of a film like Surya Vanshi or uh, maybe, you know, politicians that are, uh, you know, several miles away from us. Here's a cartoon on the globe skimmer from my book, Green Humor for, for a Green Planet. I'll just, uh, the, my, my slideshow is replete with cartoons. So as and when they appear, I'll just leave you to read them for a minute or two. <clears throat> Now imagine a scenario where it is uh, Mauritius in, in the, uh, the early 1600s. The first Europeans are coming to the island and the dodo is still alive. All right, The dodo, the, the flightless bird that went extinct from Mauritius is still alive. And imagine a scenario where good science communication exists. People know that the dodo has a certain role in the ecosystem to play. And without the dodo, probably a lot of things about the ecology of Mauritius, say, for example, agriculture might suffer, for example, uh, you know, uh, the, the diet of other predators might, might suffer. So if these people were aware of these, the kind of role that the dodo plays in the environment, do you think the dodo might still be around? I think so. And, you know, the, I think that is what the lack of science communication is doing today. For example, these are four creatures that have gone extinct in my lifetime. These are only four creatures. There are, there are hundreds of others, there are actually thousands of others, but these four have caught my attention starkly because they are very, very remarkable. The golden toad from Costa Rica went extinct in 1989, I was born in 1987. The gastric brooding frog which raised its young in its own stomach, that went extinct from Australia in 1990 actually, I'm, I'm sorry the year is typed incorrectly. The Pinta Island tortoise, one of the largest reptiles to uh, terrestrial reptiles to ever roam the earth, went extinct in 2012. And the Bramble K. melomis, which was the first mammal to go extinct because of climate change, died out in 2016. And the sad part is that I was not even aware that a creature like the Bramble K. melomis exists before it made the news by going extinct. And that is why I think, uh, you know, creative communication is needed so badly. I think here, uh, even though great science is happening today, you know, new discoveries are being made day in and day out and science is being updated uh, every day, every single day. I think science have, uh, scientists have faltered uh, in the department of communicating their science effectively to people like us. So again, if, if you, if you play, play another game, I'm gonna ask you to imagine that you are in a party. All right. And on one hand, there's this friend of yours who has just had a breakup. Okay. And if you spend the rest of the evening with this guy, he's going to bore you to, to death, telling you stories about his ex. On the other hand, you have a performer, a, a young, uh, charming, say a singer or a comedian who's enthralling the crowd with a performance. 
who would you like to spend the rest of the evening with i hope it will be uh, the person on the right uh, the comedian or the singer and that is a kind of comparison i am making between uh, you know general dreary science information and cartoons and of course if the cartoonist is young and charming as i am it's a bonus i recently had the privilege of displaying some of my work at the cop 26 the un cop 26 and to my utter horror i attended a 3 hour session or during which my work was displayed and in that session the word biodiversity was mentioned only once in 3 hours of the most important climate meeting in the whole world the word biodiversity was mentioned only once so if scientists are really serious about their work what on earth are they doing so just to illustrate this quickly uh three ways in which i think wildlife cartoons work they deliver a message of conservation without preaching they simplify jargon for the layman and instill a love respect and curiosity for nature so if science communication can be thought of as a pizza the seasoning the oregano and the chili flakes could be the cartoons quick examples to illustrate th these three points here's a cartoon on palm oil we all know what kind of devastation palm oil is wreaking uh, in rainforests in southeast asia the orangutan is one of uh, the worst victims of of edible palm oil and this is something that we use day in and day out in in a lot of edible products and a lot of uh, cosmetics that that uh, that we consume how do cartoons simplify scientific jargon if i tell you that the mammary gland of the elephant is located in the pectoraxillary region which is actually the same space where the human mammary gland is located you may or may not retain this information but if i show you a cartoon about it i am very sure you will not forget this piece of information for the rest of your lives how do cartoons instill a love respect and curiosity for wildlife uh, this is a an example very close to my heart again this is a, a cartoon from my book it speaks about the pet trade in the amazon and one particular creature the pygmy marmoset which is the world's smallest monkey it is the size of a human finger and this monkey suffers majorly from this pet trade so after reading this comic which was published in, in a, an american website a reader from peru wrote to me saying that he was actually considering buying this animal as a pet and he refrained from doing so after reading reading my work so this is one such example where my work where i can safely claim that my work has actually saved the life of a wild animal and it is more such tangible impacts of my work that i aspire to achieve in the near future here are some cartoons from from my book the book is divided into several chapters uh, some that speak about the gloom and doom part of uh, climate science and what is happening around the world because of uh, global warming and climate change and there are other chapters that speak about ecology of wildlife mammals birds insects and what kind of lessons we can draw from nature to make our lives better the book also focuses on lesser known animals like frogs we we tend to uh, as communicators we tend to uh, focus only on the glamorous creatures like tigers like birds and te we tend to ignore the very nuts and bolts of an ecosystem so frogs are one such creature this is a cartoon about plastic pollution of marine environments birds are among my favorite subjects uh, because the kind of mischief and character that, that they exude i don't find uh, it in, in other kinds of creatures the hoopoe is one bird that is very commonly seen in our city and uh, and quite metaphorically it is also orange in color there is a, a chapter in the book devoted to cartoons about insects one of which is the dung beetle and if you go to gorewada uh, early in the morning for a walk you will notice that the nilgai uh, you know uh, th there are nilgai droppings uh, on the trails and you can see dung beetles in gorewada carrying these uh, droppings away bottom trawling of seafood and how uh, how destructive it is to marine environments like coral reefs there is a section in my book which speaks speaks about environmental politics in this country and also abroad uh, and 
this is one of one such cartoon <coughs> In the race for development, India is beginning to forget uh, its conservation ethics that it has uh, lived with and been a, and a prime example for other countries in the world to follow. Uh, but sadly, uh, there, there have been some developments recently which do not go uh, hand in hand with conservation. One of them was a draft EIA notification that came out last year. And there is a comic in the book that explains why this particular notification of the government is contentious with the principles of conservation. There is a chapter in the book that deals with environmental effects of how and uh, why pandemics occur and how coronavirus in particular is related to environmental destruction. So that's the first book, Green Humor for a Growing Planet. You will find it both on Amazon and in bookstores. And, and I'm very happy to tell you that uh, it performed as a bestseller on Amazon uh, for the first two months of its release. Some of my publishers that, uh, that run these uh, cartoons that I just showed you on, uh, both online and in the print are Go Comics, which is a Universal Press Syndicate website, Sunday Midday, which comes out of Bombay, The Hindu, which comes out of Chennai, Round Glass Sustain is, is a, an emerging and a very uh, popular wildlife magazine that is published online. And I'm also represented, represented by Cartoon Collections and Cartoon Stock, which are cartoon licensing companies from the US and UK. I'm also uh, uh, have a web presence. Uh, my website is called greenhumor.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I have a web store that prints and ships my, my merchandise worldwide. Coming to my second book, it's, uh, it's meant for a slightly younger audience, uh, even though I do not believe in restricting literature to any kind of age groups. Uh, this book is called Naturalist Study. It is uh, a series of detective mysteries uh, based on nature. And, and how a, a detective called, Nat, called Naturalist Ruddy, who's a Ruddy Mongoose, goes about solving these little crime scenes in nature. And in the process, the reader gets more intimate uh, with, with a particular creature, with a particular wild animal and its environment. So who is Naturalist Ruddy? Naturalist Ruddy is a Ruddy Mongoose who's always ready for adventure. And the book invites you to join him in unlocking some of these fascinating mysteries in the natural world. Where is Ruddy from? Again, I am from Nagpur, and uh, Nagpur is surrounded by tiger reserves. There is boar, there is kana, there's pens, there's tadova. So uh, I've observed a lot of wildlife growing up in, in Kana, and I've also worked in Kana for the forest department on this particular illustration. Uh, if you visited Kana, you might know that uh, Kana was the first uh, tiger reserve to officially have a mascot in India, which was Bhur Singh the Bara Singha. And that was also designed by me. So uh, Ruddy. Uh, Naturalist Ruddy is a Ruddy Mongoose that, who lives in Kana Tiger Reserve. This is what a Ruddy Mongoose actually looks like. These are pictures again from Kana and this is the kind of habitat where you can expect uh, this beautiful animal in. Why did I choose to make a Mongoose a detective? It's simply because Mongoose is the way they move and the, the way they, uh, the how stealthy and vigilant they, they, they always are makes for a, for, or for a very perfect detective. So Naturalist Ruddy, when he goes about solving these cases, use some tools of the detective trade. One is binoculars, which is very uh, handy when watching birds and insects from a distance. A notepad to make his notes. Ruddy also uses a digital camera to capture whatever he sees. Sometimes he uses laptops and software like Adobe Photoshop to, uh, to delve deeper into his images. And Ruddy has a very bad habit. He steals camera traps that have been installed by organizations like the Wildlife Institute of India or the Wildlife uh, Conservation Trust in his territory to see what these cameras have captured. And of course, a detective hat. Ruddy also has a few friends, even though uh, Mongoose is a solitary creature, Ruddy has a few friends who he consults when solving his cases. One is Hatson, his trusted hat. If you've read Sherlock Holmes, you'll know that this is a slight tribute to uh, the character Watson, who is uh, Sherlock Holmes' trusted aide. Uh, the molecular biologist, Dr. Shama, who is a white rum Shama. Shamas are songbirds uh, related to robins that are also found in Kanha. So why, uh, this white rum Shama called Dr. Shama is a molecular bio biologist who helps natural study. And detective Herschel Piero, a red Piero butterfly, 
for agatha christie fans you'll know that this is my hat tip to uh, the the legendary fictional detective hercule poirot so what exactly happens in this book let me take you through one such crime scene that which naturally naturally study solves using his wit and his humor so here's a cave now this cave is a, is an actual cave that i have uh, visited which is close to bo tiger reserve a lot of people from nagpur will be familiar with this place so here's a cave which is only 2 feet in diameter and uh, the mouth of the cave is 2 feet in diameter and right outside this cave naturally study has spotted the remains of a sambar uh, the sambar is india's largest deer it is about 6 feet in 6 feet tall as as tall as a human being much heavier and only large animals uh, are usually capable of killing it like tigers and leopards so naturally study has spotted the remains of a sambar right outside a cave which is only 2 feet in diameter automatically he guesses that whatever killed this creature is resting in this cave but which animal that can kill india's biggest deer can only be 2 feet in size so let's solve this mystery with, with naturalist ready i'm going to read out the sequence as it plays in the book <clears throat> ready takes cover behind a boulder and keeps his eyes glued to the cave's entrance the culprit is certainly a crepuscular creature to have disappeared in the cover of the cave's darkness during the day ready assesses crepuscular means animals that are active only during early dusk and dawn not during the day <clears throat> at dusk a snout emerges ready can barely contain his curiosity the deer hunter is seconds away from disclosing its identity holy snakes ready has this annoying habit of uh, of uh, using his own invented cuss words so holy snakes an indian crested porcupine can a porcupine really kill a deer let's find out ready was right to guess that the cave's occupant was a crepuscular animal but completely wrong to assume it had killed the stag the herbivorous porcupine has a habit of picking bones and antlers from carcasses to later munch on them and supplement its diet with calcium care for some crunchy antlers offers the porcupine being a carnivore and not really require cal- requiring calcium supplements ready declines the generous offer politely but not before mumbling some choice words at the prickly rodent for ruining his noon nap so there are many such cases about 30 39 cases in all uh, in the book that invite you to solve these various mysteries and links between the various webs of life that occur in the natural world with this crazy detective mongoose Thank you everyone for listening to me and I hope you will enjoy both my books and thanks once again to the organizers of Orange City Literary Festival and my publisher Penguin for making these arrangements thanks everyone at the approaching end of the session i would like to thank mr rohan for jo- joining us today we wish we get to hear you again and be equally thrilled as we are all today thank you sanjeev and for a dear audience and for a dear audience i'm sure that after witnessing this wonderful conversation you are on taking home an enriched and joyful version of yourself just as i will thank you for joining us today until i see you again i'm sanjeevni mishram signing off Beyond.